the elements of design, or the elements of art, as some people call them, are really the visual vocabulary of the artist. They're the things the artist has to work with. All artists work with them, photographers, designers, painters, sculptors, ceramists, everybody. Some people call these the sensory properties because we can sense them with our eyes and our hands. There are seven of these elements, and they are line, shape, form, color, value, texture, and space. We will learn what these are by working with several projects and how artists can use them in their work or how you can use them in your own work. Line is one of the basic elements of art, and a line can be made with any kind of a tool. It can be made thick or thin, organic or plain. These are contour lines being made of my own hand. Lines can be used singly, as they're used here, or as we have them in a sketchbook, lines that are just outlines, really, of the tree. We can also mass lines together, as in another sketch, where lines actually make value. Some artists, Mark Toby, for example, in his painting, has used all kinds of lines and done an overall pattern that gives us a feeling of unity over the whole surface, all being done with line of different kinds. Lines can be made with any kind of tool. You see a bunch of them here. We can make lines with a pen. See, we can make straight lines or curved lines. We can make lines with a pencil. They're kind of, it could be a little organic. See, I can make lines that are fatter, lines that are thinner. We can make lines with a marker, colored markers or straight markers. Looks like a graph line. We can make a line with pastel, which is very soft, and edges are very soft. See, and they can be very erratic. We can make lines with a, with a brush. You can dip a brush into ink, make lines with a brush. Look fat, thin very organic rather than mechanical. We can even make lines with a stick. You can take a stick and dip it in ink and you make a line that is also very organic. See, it can go fat and thin. We make very beautiful organic lines on a piece of paper. We referred before to Mark Toby's painting that's all done with lines. This is a little schematic diagram that shows kind of the lines that Mark Toby used some curled, some fat, some thin, some straight. We're going to make a project now that will use those kinds of lines and make sort of a Mark Toby-like painting. We can start using tempera colors and just start to make lines on a piece of paper, some straight, some curved, some thinner, some fatter. We keep on working with these pages and filling this whole page with these lines. I can add a mat to this. We're able to see almost a Mark Toby-like painting, almost exactly the way his began to feel. We can do this with a marker, and we can make the lines all continuous. Or we can use fatter markers like this, and we can make different kinds of, of uh, marks on there to fill that up. But those can be very attractive, non-objective paintings made completely with different kinds of lines. Cutting out a shape, this is actually an organic shape. There are two, two basic kind of shapes. One is an organic shape, which is kind of like we find in nature, and one is a geometric shape, which is usually found in things that people construct, like buildings and things like that. But these are, you know, this is a, uh, this is a geometric shape, and this is an organic shape. Those are really the two basic kind of shapes that we have to work with. Just arranging a bunch of geometric shapes on a, on a large geometric background, actually. One large rectangle inside of the white rectangle that is the paper. And I'm just going to arrange those in sort of like Matisse did with his. Look at this work of Matisse's. These are geometric shapes on here, and these are organic shapes. He used a lot more organic shapes than geometric. See the big geometric shape with an organic shape over the top of it? So you cut out a lot of shapes. If I take one organic piece and put it in with all these geometric pieces, 
it becomes a focal area, and everything will kind of uh, will kind of focus on that. So I can arrange these geometric pieces around the outside of that, and just put a mat over the top of that, and we've got a very nice little non-objective painting that's made up of all these abstract shapes that are all geometric except one organic shape, which then becomes the focal area. In order to start this next project with shape, we're going to stain paper first of all. If we just take pieces of, of uh, tissue paper, put them on some flat surface of glass or, or uh, formica surface, and then just stain them with watercolor. Just use nice bright colors and, uh, and stain them. You can put, here we're using red and orange together. Get them nice and full of color, and then put them on a, on a, a piece of paper towel to dry. When these papers are dry, we can begin to cut out of those nice colored tissue papers beautiful organic shapes. We're going to make flowers here, so we're going to make an arrangement of flowers. We can mount those in, in, uh, and we'll glue them down on a piece of white paper so that the colors show through beautifully. That We might have to cut some more flowers to, to put on here. But you're making all these wonderful organic shapes now and, uh, and putting them together to make this composition. We've mixed a little bit of white glue with water to thin it out just a little bit so it's not quite so thick. And we're going to glue these pieces of, of cut tissue paper down with that, with this white glue. Now look, if I put this paper down, or the glue down on the paper like this, put the, the uh, piece of, of uh, tissue paper over the top, then put a little bit of glue on like this to seal it down. Very bright colors show up, but see where, we, where one shape overlaps another shape, we make a third shape in between there. You'll see how dramatic that will be if we put that on a, on a piece of black paper. This is a positive shape with the flowers. This is a negative shape in the background back there. If we put a mat around all of that, we have a pretty, effective, a pretty effective piece of artwork, all done with just shape. There's no line, anything, all done with just shape, overlapping shapes, but full of shapes. So shape is really another basic element that artists have to work with. My hands are, are really surrounding this form. I'm working with the with form. Form is one of the elements that sculptures have to work with a lot. So form is really three-dimensional. I can feel organic forms like this, which are formed in nature, really. This is an organic form. I can feel forms in pods like this. I can feel them with my fingers, with my whole hands. Those are really organic forms. I can have also geometric forms, like a ball like this is really a geometric form. It's a perfect sphere, so it's a three-dimensional form. I can feel a can like this. This is a cylinder. This is a geometric form. We don't want to talk about those as shape, because shape is really two-dimensional. Form is three-dimensional. For this project, we're going to start by drawing, first of all, a two-dimensional animal. This is kind of a, like a bear, sort of. Uh, you can make, any, make animals up, uh, sort of a half animal and half some creature that you've never seen before. But make some two-dimensional shape, first of all. We're going to take this shape, then, and make a form out of that by using clay. Here, this is a this is nice red clay, a ceramic clay. And we can f begin to form that. Artists who work with form use their hands a lot so they can feel the form of what it is they're working with. Now, we're actually making this two-dimensional shape that we had, we're making that into a three-dimensional form. Now, uh, this has got an organic form to it. See, it's an animal-like form, and it's organic, sort of like the rock. Or look at this sculpture here. This was done, and this has all been fired already. This is an armadillo. But see the form, the way that changes? Every time I move that around, you know, it gets a different look to it. The form of it is different. But it's a nice, rounded, three-dimensional, organic form. And the bear, as long as the bear, we keep working on the bear, we can put, we can, you know, put hair on the side of the bear, we can make the legs long, we put a little tail on the back end by pinching it a little bit, 
and change, and then we can put that in the kill and fire that, and we'll have a nice three-dimensional animal form. Clay isn't necessarily the only thing that we can use for three-dimensional work. We can put wood things together. We could make an animal out of chunks of wood. We could use wire. You can use paper mache. You can make a mask out of paper mache and use that as a three-dimensional form. Color is the element of art that most people are familiar with, and color comes from white light. If we shine a white light through a prism of glass, it will break down into six separate colors, violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. If we want to see those colors in their truest form, we have to look at them under white light. This is Renoir's painting of fruit in a, in a, on a nice blue dish. We see we have beautiful warm colors, these red colors, and the neutral background and the, and the nice whites over here with some very nice darks in here. And we will watch these colors because these colors are going to change. We'll show you how it looks under colored light. This is under a red light now. If, with white light, we can see all these things just the way Renoir painted them. But now look at the way these colors change. Look where the white looks, the way the background, look how they change dramatically in the background. And the red fruit themselves, how they all change in a colored light. Now we'll change the color to a blue, and there's blue light. Now look, all the reds get a little bit purpler. And all the background, the background all of a sudden, because it's cool, gets to be brighter when the blue light is on it. The white changes to a pale blue. All the colors change because the color of the light changes. When we want to look at a painting, to see the true color of it, we want to look at it under white light. One of the interesting things we can do with color is to mix them. But one thing you can do to find out of how color works a little bit, watch, I'm going to mix three primary colors, the three most important colors together. That's red, yellow, and blue. So if we take a little bit of red, or a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow, and a little bit of blue, we'll clean the brush each time that we, that we do that a little bit of blue, and then we begin to pull those colors together. We pull a little bit of red in that, and we begin to get a gray color. By mixing those three colors together, we should be able to make a nice neutral gray. In order to mix colors, we have to, find, we have to know what the, the, the main colors are that we can work with. The three primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. If we begin to make a, a diagram of colors, on a, like a color wheel, we have to start out with the three primary colors. So on here, I'm going to put the three primary colors down. That's red, and yellow. Now there's 12 spaces on this color wheel, so we can arrange this any way that you, uh, that you want, really. Red, yellow, and blue. And we're taking them right out of the, out of the watercolor tray. Now, if we wanted to get the colors that go in between those, we'd have to mix these primary colors together. In actuality, all colors that we see, almost, can be mixed with these three primary colors. Those are the three primaries. If we mix red and yellow together, we'll get orange. Here's a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow. If we want to make intermediate colors, there are three secondary colors also, orange, green, and violet. Those are the six main colors if we fill those in. If we want to mix the color in between here, that's called an intermediate color by mixing yellow and orange together. Here we have a little bit of orange, we mix a little bit more yellow with it, and we get a yellow-orange. And we put that, can put that in the color wheel here. If we do that all the way around the color, all the way around this, uh, the diagram, we'll end up with what we call a color wheel. When the color wheel is finished, it makes a beautiful succession of colors all the way around the color wheel with primary, secondary, and intermediate colors. The three primaries, again, are yellow, red, and blue. When we're working with these colors now, we're going to find that in order to gray a color, we have to work with colors that are across from each other on the color wheel. Those are called complementary colors. The complementary color of yellow-orange is blue-violet. The complementary color of orange is blue exact opposites on the color wheel. So in order to understand about neutralizing color, we have to understand how the color wheel is set up. This project involves neutralizing colors to make them neutral to keep them from being so bright, as Renoir did in his painting. If we have a red like this color and we put a little bit of green with it, 
we can neutralize it and it will turn a little bit duller. If we start with green and put a little bit of red with it, it will become a little bit duller. So by mixing a complement, we are dulling the colors. If we mix two of them together, we can get this nice gray like this. If we start with orange, and we're beginning to, to, uh, to have the orange color over here, and we're going to put a little bit of blue with it, just a little, not a whole lot, just a little bit, so we just neutralize it. See what that does? That makes that color not quite so bright anymore. The orange is not so intense. And when we talk about colors being intense, we're talking about their pure color. When we dull them a little bit or neutralize them, then they are not so longer intense. See, there's, a, there's an orange that's got a little bit of blue mixed with it. If we start with the blue, let's clean the, the tray off over here. If we start with the blue, clean the brush out, then mix a little bit of orange with it, it will do the same thing. See, it changes that color so it's no longer such a bright blue. See, then that, that blue, we'll put a little bit more blue in with that. That blue turns duller. It's not quite so bright anymore, and it's been neutralized, so it's not any longer a, a bright blue color. If we mix these colors all together, the blue and the orange, we'll put a little bit more orange in there with it, a little bit of blue, then we can make a very neutral color right in the middle. See, that really is very neutralized, and neither hardly looks hardly looks either blue or orange. It looks very gray, as a matter of fact, which is just what it, the way it should look. But what we've done now in this chart is to take intense colors on the outside, mix a little bit of the complements with it, and end up with a very neutralized color in the middle. I'm looking at a black and white photograph of the Capitol building, and the, and the reason we can read this photograph is because of value contrast. Value is the light and dark in any work of art. This has a light value here, a middle value here, and a dark value here. Actually, there's a value scale here that we can tell dark value, light value, middle value, and a photograph has all of these values in it. Value contrast between dark and light is why we can see that photograph. In this project, we're going to be working with a series of, of uh, gray values in order to understand what value, how value really works in a, in a painting. So we start out with a, with a little pot of white here on our, uh, on our tray, and then put a little bit of black with it, clean the brush, put a little bit of black, and it only has to be a very, very small bit. Put it maybe out to the side here, and then go in and just mix a little bit with it in order to make a little gray, very, very light gray, and then fill this, fill this whole page with this painting of this light gray. So be sure you mix enough color so you can really cover that whole piece. Once I have all these swatches made of way from very dark to very light, and then actually even using a piece of white paper for the whitest one, we're going to cut some shapes out of these things in order to make a still life. So we can first draw on here. We can maybe make an apple shape or the shape of some fruit or bowl or bottle or something, and then cut the shape out of that. We'll just cut that, you know, it's a whole series of, of organic shapes. So they can be oranges, lemons, pears, bottles, boxes, whatever it is you want to put in the, in the still life. We have a bunch of shapes cut out, and we can always even decorate those a little bit with other values. And once you have a whole bunch of these pieces arranged, you can begin to put them together on a, on a nice, uh, on a nice background. What we did with the background here is to leave a white on the bottom and black on the top. Those are the two opposite ends of the value scale. Then we can begin to put objects on here, see, and place them on there. Notice the contrast between the dark and the light. Here's the most contrast. See, there's an apple shape. Put that next to the light. That's going to be a focal area in there. See where there's more contrast between the dark and the light. We put a mat on that, and look, we put a value scale on that, alongside of that. And here we have all these values from the very darkest to the very lightest, lots of contrast, but the reason that we can see each one of those objects is because it is a different value. Once we have this gray, black, and white collage done, we can make a painting from that, just using this as a value sketch for the painting. Look at this little gray scale down here. There's a gray scale from black to very light gray. 
There's a color scale alongside it, all the different values of orange from very light to very dark. If you match the oranges and grays on the painting with the oranges and grays on the collage, then you should get a painting that reads just as well as the collage reads, just like we started to do right here in the, in the lower right-hand corner. Look for a minute at, at Paul Clay's painting here that he did all these different values of, of uh, very few colors, very grayed colors, but all different values. If you squint and look at them, you can see light, middle, and dark valued squares. Look at the way the picture in black and white looks of the same painting, and you see the light, middle, and dark values. Texture is the element of design that appeals to your tactile sense, to your sense of touch. I feel in this ceramic piece and I can feel all those textures. Textures can either be real, like they are in the ceramic piece, or they can be implied. For example, in this photograph, it looks like it's textured, but you run your hand over the surface of that and it's actually no texture at all. In this watercolor painting, there is no texture at all. But because of value contrast, it appears to be textured. So this is a simulated texture in this watercolor. Painters can use both real texture, actual texture, and simulated texture. If we use paint that's thick enough, this is acrylic paint here, if I use it thick enough, I can pick it up with a painting knife, and I can slather it on the canvas or the piece of paper this way, and I can actually leave texture. See, I can leave ridges of paint on there, and I can either use a, use a painting knife to do that, or I can take a bristle brush and get the same kind of paint, and I can slather that on also, and then leave those rich textures, actual texture on the surface of the painting. I can also take watercolor and make simulated texture. And if I put it on the, on the piece of paper and then take a piece of Kleenex and lift a little bit on that, I can blot. I can make it look like it's textured. But in reality, because that's watercolor, there's no texture there at all. I can also take a sponge, just a little piece of sponge, and take some of that same color and print. I can make it look textury. But you see, that's simulated texture because there is no raised part there that throws shadow. It just looks like it's textured. So here we have actual textures in paint, and we have simulated textures in paint. When we want to work with textures now, we remember we can work with both simulated and with, with actual textures. In this project, we're going to work with actual textures. We have to go around and find them. I just brought along some things to the studio here. We have some bricks and wood and a piece of sculpture. And we'll find that if we take a a piece of paper and put it on over this texture. You've all done this. You've done this before. And take a piece of, uh, of crayon, of wax crayon, and rub over that. We can find the textures that are in there even more than we can when we do it with our fingers, rub our fingers over that. So you can make wonderful rubbings of all kinds of textures. Take some shaped animal here, like this, we've got this weird shaped bird. You can take some animal that comes from another planet or something really out of your imagination. Make an outline on a piece of paper, nice and big like this. Then we're going to make them textured with all of this stuff that we have here. So we can draw some of these shapes on here, or let's just cut, cut like this to, to, get, uh, to get shapes out of there. And we can always trim them off after a while. See, we can cut the back of this bird, it can be there, and you can actually change the shapes of that after a while. But, here we can put some wings on here like this. Just cut nice big shapes. And we're going to use all these big shapes, put them all together, collage them together. And the finishing touch. We'll put the last one on here. So you have one last shape. There he's got some good textures, lots of nice color. And he looks kind of, of alone like this. If we take him and put him on a piece of black cardboard like this, we see, wow, does he stand out. We have positive and negative shapes here and everything. Look, we can even go leave part of him behind the, with the black and part of him with the brown there. And then we put a mat around that and finish that up. And here we've got a wonderful thing that is really taking textures from all around us put all these textures together with watercolor 
And uh, these are really simulated textures because they're just imitating the textures that are actually there and made a handsome little bird out of those textures. What I'm doing here, these people, you see these people are all about the same size and they're all lined up here. And there's no space evident here, no depth at all, one in front of the other. So if I put one of these in front of the other one, then I begin to feel there's some space there. This one is in front of that one. And I can put this in front of that one. And I can cluster these together a little bit and get a feeling of, of space. So that if I bring a bigger person down here and put that big person in front of some of these, then that person feels a lot closer to me than the other ones do. And if I even elevate some of these so that they go up a little bit farther, and, uh, and, and the ones I want to make sure that the ones that are closest to me are down a little bit lower, then I feel more space between this big figure and that one back, those back there. If I bring some smaller ones down in here and put those up here, they feel still farther away. If I overlap figures this way, overlap anything, squares, circles, fruit, vegetables, whatever it is, they will, they will indicate there's a, some space between the one that's nearest to you and the one that's farthest away. The one that's nearest a little bit larger, maybe a little bit warmer, and also the bases of those will be closer to me. If they're, if they're nearer, farther away, the farther up the bases of those figures will be. Robert Henry, in his, in his painting here of New York in the wintertime, used another element. There's some overlapping in here to show space also going back, but he also used what we call linear perspective. He has a lot of the edges of buildings like this that go to vanishing point down here, right, probably right by the light almost. And all these things line up. See the edge of the top edge of the building there, the buildings on this side, the people down below, the tops of the, of the cart down here, and all these things. Everything goes toward this center in here, which is really a vanishing point or an area of focus back in here. Artists use that to show depth in their painting. A third type of, of uh, way to feel space is to what we call atmospheric perspective. What I want to do is to sh try to show a, a, a range of mountains or a couple of ranges of mountains here, one coming behind the other, one in front of the other one. So what I'm doing is putting washes over this whole surface, and I'll go all the way down to the bottom of the page, then let it dry, and then put another range of mountains in front of it, a little bit darker, maybe a little bit warmer. Put a little bit of purple with the color so it gets a little bit warmer. And I'll do that until I get down to the very front of the painting, and we'll see if we develop a sense of space. Each layer of color now has to get progressively brighter, stronger, and more intense. And then we'll get that feeling of space going back. See here, this one is very dark. I've put a little bit of red with it to warm it up a little. When I get that all done and that's dry, I can put a mat on that, and you'll see how the sense of space develops. With this being very close, and progressively just being farther, going farther and farther away. So there are three ways to show perspective. We can look at Robert Henry's uh, painting again to see how he does that. We can overlap things, like people can overlap people behind them. Buildings overlap buildings. We have perspective lines that go to one point perspective, and we have atmospheric perspective with these buildings being much, much lighter, these being much darker and warmer as they come forward. If we put all three of those elements together, overlapping, linear perspective, and aerial perspective, we have a tremendous sense of depth and space that develops in a painting. We've been working with a series of projects that have to deal with the elements of design. All the elements of design that we've talked about now are all the things that artists have to work with. You can work with those. You've seen projects that you can do with those. But we hardly ever use them separately. We usually use them in combination. We find, though, that if we know what all of these elements are, we can use them more effectively in our paintings. Principles of design help us organize the elements of design in a more effective way. Some people call these the formal properties of art because they are used to organize. Those principles of design are balance, movement, rhythm, 
contrast, emphasis, pattern, and unity. These principles of design always work together, and as we define them and work with them, we'll always be using one or the other of the principles to help us understand the one we're working on better. They are hardly ever used alone, always used in combinations. What I'm trying to do here is to balance these two elements in this on this ruler. I've got a heavy full can of Coke and a little jar of tempera paint. I'm trying to find a way that I can balance these. Balance is a sense of being comfortable in, a, in this, and it's also a sense of being comfortable in a work of art. So in our works of art, we have to have balance also. We'll see several ways that we can establish balance in a work of art. When two elements in a, on a balance like this, or in a painting also, are on, equal on both sides of the center, we call that symmetrical balance. If one of the elements seems much larger, but is lighter in weight than the other one, and they still seem to balance, even though they are seemingly off-center, we call that asymmetrical balance. In sculpture, if we look at a, at a sculpture, the sculpture is balanced symmetrically. Right down the middle, both elements on both sides are exactly the same. I have another little owl here that is asymmetrically balanced. If we put a line here about where, the, where there's equal amount of weight on one side or the other, there's much more on one side, but it seems balanced because of the activity, all the activity and the head being on this side of the sculpture. Paintings also can either be symmetrical or asymmetrically balanced. This painting by Frida Kahlo is symmetrically balanced, with almost everything on one side being the same as that on the other. If we look at a Winslow Homer painting, Winslow Homer's painting has many more objects on one side than it does on the other. It's not symmetrically balanced. If we put a line down the middle, there's more weight on one side than the other. But the little bright spot over here seems to balance all of this weight on this side. Not all paintings need to be balanced asymmetrically or symmetrically. If we look at Mark Toby's painting with an all-over pattern, there's no need to balance because everything seems to be already in balance. If we want to make projects using symmetrical balance, we can make a whole lot of charts like this with nice bright colors and cut out paper so they're exactly the same on one side as the other. I can make them very fancy. I can keep adding pieces to that. I can keep building those up and making them keeping them in symmetrical balance. This would not be in symmetrical balance. So I could put that back in exactly the way it was in symmetrical balance. I can put lines down the center. So you can do all kinds of pieces of paper. You can draw in there, paint in there, add postage stamps, whatever you want to do, but every, keeping everything the same on both sides of the center line. Asymmetrical balance and projects that work with asymmetrical balance means that we have to have Larger spaces on one side, maybe they're duller in color, balanced by a smaller space farther away from the center, from the fulcrum, that gives a sense of balance, a sense of being comfortable. So when we want to play with those, we have to say we work on projects that are going to, going to, uh, to use those things. We have to put colors on one side that are a little bit duller, on the other side a little bit brighter to make them seem in balance. We can even move this over to the center a little bit to keep that, that feels in balance. If this were very bright over here, if we put something over here like this, it would no longer be in balance. This would be stronger. So we want to keep one side a little bit neutral, make the other side a little bit brighter. If we can look at this nice bright red over here. We can balance that. We can move that out farther even if that's, if that's so bright in order to make that uh, and keep that in balance. Look, for example, at asymmetrical balance. Here's a photograph that is in visual balance, even though it's asymmetrical. If we put a line down the center of that, there's more activity on one side, but it's duller, more the same. Over here, we have a lot of contrast between dark and light. Visually, that feels comfortable. Movement, in, in, uh, as a principle of design, is the way we have of organizing the painting by forming movement toward a focal area. The focal area in this painting of Diego Rivera's is the place where the slave is being freed with the knife. Notice all the shapes, the dark shapes, move toward this place. The light shapes down here move toward this place. 
So shapes move toward this place. That's a, a, a kind of movement that we have in the painting. In sculpture also, we have visual movement. Our eye moves like from the tail here, across the back, up to the focal area, which happens to be the head and the, with these floppy ears. Most of the time, the focal area in an animal would be the head. And movement is very important in a sculpture. We can feel it with our hands as that movement goes toward the focus. Movement goes along long shapes like this. Long, such long shapes will help direct our eye toward some part of the painting. We can make a little project by putting some of these shapes down, these long shapes down this way, and then putting a different kind of paper, a different kind of shape, where the focal area would be. See, we can bring these in close so that our eye moves along these lines toward that focal area. We put a little mat over that. We have a very nice design that will, that will show movement toward a focus, visual movement toward the focus. We can use curved pieces, which are much more interesting and much more fun to work with, also to move toward a focal point. So before you collage these down, stick them down, you can have them overlapping, winding around, but they're all curved pieces all leading toward a focal area. That focal area, of course, is right in here. Notice how your eye just moves automatically on those long pieces. If we put a different shape in there, like a little rectangle, that makes it, I can put a little red dot in that rectangle even to make that definitely a focal area. And see if I put a little a mat over that. You can't help but be drawn in on that, and that's what visual movement does in a painting. It pulls the outside edges right into the focal point. What I'm doing here is arranging a bunch of black pieces of paper on a white, on a white background in order to produce movement. I'm going to make a collage out of this, but I want movement to go on white spaces into some, like this is going to be the focal area, that our eye will move on this, our eye will move on this. See those long pieces, like in our last exercise, those long pieces will help produce movement. And this is what we call visual movement or passage from one part of the painting to the other. And a lot of paintings need to have that in order to hold them together. In one of my watercolors, we can analyze a little bit and see how movement works in a painting. This house is a focal area. This is a painting done in Hawaii. Notice how the light moves from here, from the lower left-hand corner up to the focal area, from the sky up on top down into the focal area. From the upper left-hand corner, these neutral grays move down into the focal area. Everything in the painting leads to the focal area. A big shape over here on the right side moves down into the focal area, almost like those little strips that we cut, only this is with actual subject matter. So every painting, like a landscape like this, is more effective if there is a focal area and then movement on light value or dark value, visual movement to that focal area. What I'm trying to do here is to arrange these objects. I have some figures and some pillars or, or posts. Arrange them in some sort of a rhythmic pattern. Rhythm is a principle of design that helps us to organize space by having regular repetitions of, of things happening. We can have regular rhythm, where these could be exactly equally spaced, or we can have irregular rhythm, where we do something like this, that these pieces would still be there in a rhythmic way, but they would be irregular, not quite so, so evenly spaced. When we look at paintings, we can find that happening in the paintings. We can look at Marcel Duchamp's painting of, of uh, New Descending a Staircase, and we see these rhythmic repetitions, repetitions of the legs, repetitions of the hips, repetitions of the shoulders, repetitions of the head. This is an abstract painting, but with the repetition and the rhythm, the painting holds together very, very well. We can look at one of Louise Nevelson's sculptures, a photograph of one of her sculptures. Look at the rhythmic pattern over here. Nice repetition helps to organize this part of her composition. Look at Robert Rauschenberg's painting. The red spots in here produce a rhythm because those reds keep popping out all the time, but it's an irregular rhythm. They're all grouped together down here, one by itself here, little bits of red over here, so the rhythm in this painting is irregular. So we can have regular and irregular rhythm that artists use to help organize their painting. We can also work with a different group of shapes. We're using a whole lot of elements here from other projects that we worked on. But notice that how complex this can get down here. We still have the rhythms established. These are irregular rhythms. 
Usually, irregular rhythms are more exciting than regular rhythms. They might get a little bit monotonous. But the pinks begin to repeat, the people repeat, the greens repeat, the yellows repeat. We have all these repetitious shapes in here. We have a focal area right in here now in this design because of this shape that's different from all the others. So we have movement, and we have focus in here, and we have a beautiful set of rhythms that are being established. Architects are probably the kind of artists that make the most use of rhythm in their work. Notice in the Parthenon, which was designed by an architect a long, long time ago, notice the way the rhythm is in the columns. And that helps unify the surface and helps hold it together. Look at the landscape over here. We have a very irregular rhythm. Notice where the trees create an irregular rhythm. Usually when trees are just growing in, in the wilds, they are not in a rhythmic, regular rhythmic pattern, but in an irregular rhythmic pattern. What I'm doing here is feeling the contrast between a smooth surface and a rough surface on this ceramic pot. Contrast is the principle of design that helps give us a little bit of excitement in our painting. The opposite of contrast would be, would be sameness, and sameness leads to boredom. So when we want works of art to be exciting, we have to have some sort of contrast. In a painting like Paul Cezanne's Still Life, the artists use a great many kinds of contrast. For example, to make it exciting, he used contrast between plain areas with no pattern and areas that have lots of pattern. He has contrast between edges that are hard and crisp and edges that are very soft and almost disappear. He contrasts very dark values with very light values. He contrasts intense colors bright yellows and reds, with very neutralized colors that are very gray. He contrasts warm temperatures in many places with cool temperatures, grays, greens, and blues. He contrasts textured areas, like all of this cloth in the background here, with non-textured areas, like the surface of the table. He contrasts geometric shapes, like the edges of the table, with very organic shapes of the fruit and vegetables. He contrasts large shapes, and very large shapes like this back here, and large negative shapes with very small shapes. So he has all of those contrasts, eight of them all together, probably more in here, but all of those contrasts help make that painting very, very interesting. One way that you can really begin to understand contrast is to work with a chart that really shows contrast. For example, I started one here, and we're going to keep working on that now, that, that, that shows intense color, very bright right the way it comes out of the bottle, and then neutralized with a complementary color. We can show dark value of the same color and light value. We can show edges that are soft, you can paint them that way, edges that are hard. You can paint these larger, cut them out, and then put them on the chart. We have an area that has no pattern. These are all of Cezanne's contrast, and we have area that is patterned. Now we can find things in magazines. For example, we have cool temperature and warm temperature contrast. I cut some pages out of a magazine that show warm temperatures and those that show cool temperatures. We can make check areas that are textured and non-textured. This is a textured and a non-textured area. We can do, do ones with uh, areas with geometric shapes. We can put those in a little collage and, and, and mount those on there on the chart. Or we can make them with organic shapes. So we cut pieces that are not geometric. We can make a little collage out of, out of organic shapes. And then we can contrast large and small. And we can put some large shapes in here. And see, we can put bigger, big shapes on one side to, to show large shapes. And then we can put confetti-like pieces on the other side. This is something that that uh, makes a big mess, but it also emphasizes the fact that there are the difference between large shapes and small shapes. And then you have a chart that has eight different kinds of, of uh, contrasts on it. And if you understand these contrasts, then you're able to and put them in your paintings and make your paintings more interesting. They certainly will not be boring or the same if you continue to use all these kinds of contrasts.
I'm working on a collage here that is going to emphasize emphasis. And we're going to put, this is really emphasizing a, a very warm colors, and they're going to contrast with, with uh, cool colors. I'm going to do kind of a poinsettia-like uh, design. The focal point is going to be right in here. Now, where we put the focal point in a painting is rather important. If we put a focal point, you know, we don't want to put the focal point right in the middle. That doesn't make it very interesting. If we make a few lines on our, on our uh, paper before we start, where these cross, this is a good place for a focal point, here and here and here and here. So if we turn it up like this, we're doing the vertical, this is a good place to put the focal point. And we're going to emphasize movement toward that focus, and then the focus itself will be my point of emphasis. This is going to be kind of an abstract collage of a uh, poinsettia plant. So we'll put some of these colors down. These are nice bright red colors, and I'm using two values of the colors. You see that? One's darker than the other. By doing that, I'm able to make shapes inside of this big, this big overall uh, pattern of, uh, of poinsettias. So I will have, have uh, light shapes and dark shapes. If I put the dark shapes together, like this, one next to the other one, I'm creating movement. See, I'm moving from one shape to another, but the values are the same, moving toward the focus up here. So if I keep doing this, I'll be able to fill the whole page up with, this, with, this, uh, with these big pieces of nice bright red color. In the focal area itself, I want to have something a little bit different. And in a poinsettia, that focal area might be pieces of yellow. The emphasis on this, in this collage is on the red and on movement toward the focus. So I'll fill this whole page up with, uh, with uh, uh, pieces of red color this way. And we'll take a look at it and see how the, how the design will uh, look when it gets finished. Just putting the finishing touches in here, this is a nice red design, and it will show how the emphasis begins to work. And I'm really putting some brighter yellow colors in, this, in the focal area because that's my point of emphasis in here. Now look how these colors all begin to work together. This is kind of an abstract design. Now, it turned out a little bit more abstractly. I've put colors over the top and, and changed them a little bit. This one is very abstract. I've done another one that I did before that is a little bit more realistic, but has the same properties to it, that the emphasis is really on moving up into the painting toward this focal area. Here, there is great contrast, so the emphasis is placed right there. But the emphasis is really also on the fact that this is a warm painting with cool contrast. The emphasis is on a warm dominance with cool accents, and then the focal area being in this location up here. Notice how Toulouse-Lautrec, when he made this painting, made the emphasis up in here. This is where we, what we call, what we call our focal area. And he has these big shapes leading up to that focal area. Actually, the emphasis here is on this group of people. But the contrast in here between warm and cool and dark and light make the emphasis right here and that becomes our focal point. Not all paintings really need to have that. Look at Jasper John's painting here, which doesn't have any focus. The emphasis here is on color and on the, on the rhythmic pattern that is being developed, not on a focal point. I'm looking at a, at a piece of Indonesian batik, which has been printed in a pattern Pattern is one of the principles of design that some artists use. Architects use it a great deal, uh, but painters also use it, and many designers do. Pattern is repeated elements of, the, of design. Any of the elements of design can be used. Line, texture, shape, color. Look at the pattern on the outside here as it's repeated around the edge. That's a border pattern. This little piece has also got re pattern in it repeated constantly from one part to another, over and over and over and over again, to make a regular pattern. This is a regular on the outside. Patterns can be both regular and irregular, but these are all regular patterns that are woven into that cloth. Wallpaper also has a pattern. Look at the repeated elements that keep repeating all the time. Here are repeated lines, repeated textures, and since they're repeated on regular intervals, we call this regular pattern. We can find pattern in nature also, both regular and irregular. When you cut into a piece of fruit, like this grapefruit, you can find regular pattern. Those segments are repeated, 
again and again all the way around this circular design. Here we have a rock that has holes in it. The holes make a pattern in the rock. Those patterns are irregular. They're not in a regular sequence. I'm just experimenting a little bit here. This is just an eraser that I'm printing. Printing is very probably the best way to show repeat patterns because you can repeat exactly the same shape again and again, but I see I can make it irregular. Here's the same shape repeated, but it becomes irregular as far as the pattern is concerned. If we want to make regular patterns, then we have to lay out a, a design on a piece of paper that is in a regular pattern. If I take this angel and print it and put it in one of these spots, and print it again here, and print it again here. And see, I can work it like this. This is called a drop pattern when, when things are, when they don't show up right directly below, one below the other, but drop down and move over to the side. That's called a drop pattern. And that's why you see a lot of, of wallpaper is made that way. So you just would alternate squares that way and build up a regular pattern. I can also make those, take those same things and make irregular patterns with them. I can use the angel to make an irregular pattern by putting the angel there and putting her there. And see, I can just make an irregular pattern. The angel is repeated, the element is repeated, but it's repeated in an irregular way. I'm making pattern here, a three-dimensional pattern, actually, making it in a piece of clay. Pattern in clay is fun to make. See, this is a regular pattern being repeated just one mark after another. I could use other kinds of tools to make other kinds of patterns. See, this will make a different kind of pattern. As long as I repeat, I could repeat those like a brick pattern. See, I could do them this way, like a drop pattern, one alternating with the other one as it goes along here. So you have different kinds of pattern. But the pattern is the thing that makes the surface of a, of a clay body interesting, or it makes the surface of your painting interesting also. People who work with uh, quilts also have to use pattern continually. If an architect designs the front of a building, he wants the pattern on the front of the building to make that facade of the building more interesting. If we look at Paul Clay's painting, Paul Clay's painting also has pattern. Those repeated squares make pattern, like a checkerboard almost, but because of the way Paul Clay put them together, it certainly is not monotonous. What I'm trying to do here is to bring order out of chaos. There are a bunch of pieces of colored paper here. I'm trying to organize them and trying to create some kind of unity that it all feels together. The opposite of unity is chaos, and that's about the way this, this seems now. Uh, we, we can create a sense of, of unity a little bit if we kind of bring these together a little, but if we overlap them and bring them closer together, even pieces that are closer together, they'll begin to feel more unified if we kind of cluster them. So by bringing them closer together, I can make them feel unified. If I take out a few of these colors, like take out some of these green ones, maybe leave one for accent after a while, and have all the colors more related to each other, that establishes a greater sense of unity. See, they're all kind of warm against that cool background, and that establishes a better sense of unity. I can also line up edges. I can take the edges of these things and line them up so that they, they uh, continue from one edge to another and can tie the pieces together like that so that that edge goes all the way across, comes down and, and ties those, if I tie those edges together, that will give me another sense of unity, of establishing a sense of belonging, everything belonging together. Unity actually in a work of art, see if I line things up like this a little bit, unity in a work of art means that, that everything seems to belong, everything seems to work together. And then if I put, a, put this green piece in here as a, as a focal area, see I can get all these pieces together. I've left out a few of those green ones. I've unified it by using similar warm colors with a cool accent, lining up edges, clustering things together. All of those are ways that artists can use to unify a painting. If we look at a couple of works of art that people have done just in recent years, we can see how unity has been established by these artists. Louise Nevelson in her wood construction has all kinds of pieces of wood. If we look at the center part in here, it doesn't have any relation to these pieces at all, except that they're three-dimensional, but by painting them all white, 
that unifies this whole surface. It's going to be a very many different kinds of things happening, but a single color will help unite them all. You can look at the painting, a painting by George Seurat. Now look at the unity that's established in here. It's almost by technique, because all the figures are painted very much alike with all their hard edges and their stylization. It helps unify the whole surface, because the figures are all over the surface. Not only that, all this surface is made up of very small dots in a technique called pointillism. And all those points of color help establish a sense of unity also throughout the surface. It's all a similar kind of texture. So by style and by texture and by brush stroke, we can also establish unity in the painting. Look at one of Van Gogh's drawings. The reason this is unified is because you can see all of those marks, little dots, little lines, helps establish a sense of unity. So does the feeling of going from forward back into the painting in perspective. That helps establish unity. And the same color is used in the ink throughout the work. So here we have marks, the kind of marks, the kind of color, the feeling of space going back into the painting. That establishes unity. Edgar Degas and his pastel used all of the principles of design, practically all of them, in order to make one unified statement. He used balance, asymmetrical balance. See, if we divide this up smaller here, bigger here on this side, more activity over here. He used movement. All of these things, parts move. The values move. The colors move. Look at the rhythm that he used. The, all the rhythms of the hands and the arms, the rhythms of the skirts down here, all of those help unify the surface. He used lots of contrast between dark and light, between big open spaces and very congested spaces, between warm and cool, Got all kinds of, of uh, contrast happening also. Some artists, like Edgar Degas, use almost every one of the principles of design in order to complete his work. Not all artists use all the principles, but some of them use almost every one, as Degas did in his work. And when he gets done, he has a very, very beautiful, fully organized and very cohesive and unified work.